following a stroke, you may experience difficulty registering the same sensations you once did. This presentation provides an overview of some common sensory loss implications, as well as recommendations for managing these shifting senses. To provide a brief outline, we'll start with some sensation basics before going into current research in somatosensory impairments. This research includes its effect on participation in daily activities, as well as a view of sensory loss from the perspectives of survivors of stroke. We'll touch on the implications of sensory disturbances before going into some tips, sensory training, and tools that can help bridge the gap. So some sensation basics, approximately 85% of survivors of stroke experience sensory changes. These changes are typically one of the first to be noticed and can include experiencing pain, sensitivity, numbness, aching, burning, or tingling. Take a second to think about if any of these experiences describe what you felt following your stroke. Has this sensation or lack thereof subsided or remained post-stroke? Knowing how and when these sensory changes affect you can help to inform how you can combat them. So we hear the word somatosensation often, and there's a reason for that. One out of two people experience disturbances in body sensation post-stroke. This common occurrence comes from the Greek for body, soma, or somato, plus sensation, somatosensation. This can include your perception of touch. So where exactly on your body you are feeling something. It can include your ability to perceive temperature and pressure, and it can also upset our discrimination of textures and ability to recognize objects through touch. You may have heard of this being referred to as stereognosis. One study from 2018 looked at the effect that a loss of body sensation has on a survivor of stroke's ability to participate in their daily activities. Researchers gained data from 268 participants reporting on instrumental activities, like shopping, taking care of the home, social activities, like meeting a friend for lunch, high demand physical activities, like going for a swim, and low demand physical activities, like table games. They would rate each activity according to a number one through five. One being they've never done the activity, two being they gave up the activity due to stroke, three, doing less often due to stroke, or four, they're doing the activity right now. Results were gathered at a mean of 222 days post-stroke or a little over seven months. Of those that participated, 33.6% experienced somatosensory impairment. Their results found that while somatosensory impairment is undoubtedly associated with reduced activity participation, paresis of upper and lower limbs can mask the contribution of sensory loss. Because of this, researchers suggest motor-based interventions involve a somatosensory component for a more holistic approach. Another study out of 2018 looked at some of the most pressing and or frequent issues survivors of stroke encounter following decreased somatosensation. These included personal care and dressing, so things like styling your hair, brushing teeth, putting earrings on, and even just buttoning up a coat or zipping up a jacket. Cooking and eating was also mentioned, and that could be having difficulty cracking an egg or whipping food. Leisure activities were also a big one. So gardening, playing tennis, applying brakes on a bicycle, or just finding and using your safety belt in the car. They found that some of the most common coping strategies participants utilized to fight their lessened sensation were in simply using their non-affected hand when the activity required it. This naturally led to a declined use of the affected limb. Participants also relied more on their visual sensation to make up for any deficits elsewhere. Overall, participants made it clear that their rehabilitation was spent mostly in working to regain motor function with very little emphasis or training on sensory impairments. 
So why is our sensation important? It's usually something we take for granted when it's intact. When experiencing somatosensory changes, however, caring for the affected limbs is essential. If temperature sensation is off, skin can be damaged in extreme temperatures. That might be accidentally resting a forearm on a hot stove or near a candle. Hypersensitivity is another common occurrence where pain can be felt with light touch or movement. Clothing can even become uncomfortable or painful. A change or loss of bladder or bowel sensation can lead to incontinence problems. And paresthesias like numbness, aching, burning, tingling, or that pins and needles feeling can strike. Proprioception is our sense of physical self-awareness in relation to our environment. And when this is interrupted, it can affect our ability to walk steadily, even if our muscle movements are still intact. How our body interacts with its environment informs a lot of how we respond. With that in mind, movement in general can lack precision, control, and accuracy, contributing to some imbalance. Vision is another sensory component that can be affected following stroke. This can encompass problems in visual field loss. So this is when you lose an area of vision in your visual field, typically on the same side of the body where any other sensation changes have occurred. Eye movement issues and visual processing or how your brain receives and interprets the information it is viewing. And also smaller effects might include dry eyes or becoming more sensitive to light. Visual field loss occurs in approximately 30 to 35% of survivors of stroke and typically affects half of the field of vision in both eyes. So some vision impairment tips. With diplopia or double vision, try closing one eye or using a patch when you're reading or watching TV. If you have an old pair of glasses, you can tape over one lens to decrease the doubling effect as shown here. With any visual neglect, make sure to scan your surroundings. It's a simple thing to do, but can make life much safer for you once you've formed it as a habit. Also, when reading, you can use a ruler to follow along as you read, line by line, or try visual anchoring. Visual anchoring is the use of an eye-catching visual cue, like a bright post-it note or colored tape or a, a red mark that's gone to possibly the left side of the page or maybe the right, depending on where your visual neglect affects you. This encourages the eye to anchor itself back to it following the end of each line. Also with lighting, try to A, have everywhere in your home well lit, most importantly, and B, avoid too many table lamps as they can project a shadow if placed behind you or they can be disorienting when placed in front of you. Lastly, reducing clutter can help prevent falls and improve your ability to recognize objects. So make sure to explain your needs to your loved ones. Vision impairment isn't always seen by those who you may be talking to, and how it affects you personally cannot be fully understood unless it is communicated. So make sure to take some time in explaining your needs to those who care about you. Active sensory training is a way to not only gauge some deficiencies, but also to re-educate your senses. An example of active sensory training could be in differentiating between textures like cotton, sandpaper, satin, wool, purely by touch with no visual aids. You can also hide objects such as marbles, coins, and other household objects in a bowl of dry rice or dry beans. And without using vision, try to find the objects with your hand and with your hand only. You can have another person touch you on one spot with your eyes open, then with your eyes closed. Try to associate where you saw the object touch your skin to know how it felt on your skin. You can also try having another person keep pressure still on your skin, then move it around, watch and pay attention to how it feels, then close your eyes and try to identify when the pressure is still versus when it is moving. Another option is in differentiating vibrations. Close your eyes and have a person apply vibration to your skin via a massager. 
See if you can identify when the vibration is applied to the skin. Have the person move the vibration around and see if you can tell when it is still versus moving around on your skin. Identifying objects by touch is another option. Have someone place different objects in your hand while you are looking, like a cotton ball, marble, key, or paperclip. Then close your eyes and try to identify objects as they are placed in your hand, again, one at a time. You can also use vision to find grasp strength. So an example of this would be in filling up a flexible paper cup, like a Dixie cup, half full with water. Attempt to grasp the cup without spilling the water or smashing the cup. Use your vision to determine how much pressure you are putting on the cup. If the cup is slipping out of your hand, apply more pressure. If the cup is squeezing too hard, the squeeze too hard, lessen your grip. Repeat the exercise with paper cup above, but now move the cup from one spot to another, maintaining a steady, even grasp. Not too tight, not too loose. You can also detect temperature differences. So have another person apply cold or warm washcloth to your skin and see if you can detect temperature differences as they're moved about your body. Another option is feeling an object, then trying to find a matching object inside a bowl of dry beans or rice. And you can also close your eyes and have someone else position your affected arm. See if you can tell what position your arm is in. For example, maybe they bent your elbow. Then open your eyes to see what position it is in to see if you were correct. You can also attempt differentiating lighter versus heavier objects just by feel. So close your eyes and have someone else place a lighter object on your hand, then a heavier object. Try to determine which object is heavier or lighter. Lastly, you can block your vision or close your eyes, have someone else move your hand while holding a pencil, and try to identify what letter, number, or drawing is being made. So around the house, there are a few easy modifications you can make to your home to adapt to changes in sensation. And an important concept to achieve is contrast. Make sure to place brightly colored decor on neutral tone furniture. Make sure text color contrasts background color and use brightly colored stickers on buttons. So that might help you out with a remote or even settings on your oven. You can also mark step edges on your stairs with reflective tape or bright tape to be aware of and see each step as you go. Now there's a website called maxiaids.com and they have quite a few different tools that we can all try out. Um, but I chose a few here that are under $20 and they can help with any changes in sensation. So this one here is about $18 and it's called a pan pickle and it's able to be put on the stove top um, to guard against spills and to avoid um, any loss of support when you're holding on to your pan as you're cooking. Another is about $10 and it's the Tenura molded cup holder and that's great for grip and it also provides a little bit of extra weight when you're holding it up. Cool touch oven rack guards are about $20 and they're great for when you're reaching into the oven and maybe your forearm, forearm might hit that hot part or it might be your digits, but either way, it, it provides a little bit of a barrier to that, to the heat of the plates in the oven. The last little tool here that you can purchase is about $9 and it's called the Perfect Opener. And it just has a few different um, universal cap sizes and openings, crevices that you're able to place different items in in order to open or twist or pop off. So it can come in handy in that way too. And then we just have some references at the end here. So thank you for listening.